let's see, what are we gonna talk about? Um, Try it. Well, we need good topics or something, right? We need so frequencies, a human design podcast. <laughs> With my so guest. That was that like. A, do you did you decide to start a podcast yesterday? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> how do you I? You did, put... didn't you? <laughs> how do I? How do I make our faces side by side? Oh, you go up to view in the upper right hand corner, and you switch to gallery, from speaker to gallery. Wow, that's great. Can I choose what side? Oh my god, I can <laughs> choose what side we're on. <laughs> I want to be on this side. Uh, yeah, look at that. I'm learning See, for me. Do. It's I have my own choice. I can have it however I want it as well. <laughs> okay. So you choose what side you want to so be. So I don't. I'm not seeing what you're seeing. I see. You look like you're in a spaceship. I like the space behind you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm. I we all are um, shooting through space. Spaceship Earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, Earth, does Earth even really exist? Oh, we're, we're living it. We're living on it. And I can, uh, I actually have been editing more. You'd be proud of me. I've been, I've been really enjoying it. I know, dude, your TikTok, um, your thing where you took all the TikToks and turned them into one video with the, with the Fender Roads in between. That's sick, dude. It's so good. Thank you. Thank you. That, that yeah, that format is great. It's like a it's it's like a show. It's very good. Thank you. Thank I, you. I'd, I'd like to see you do that with like all your little series. The student is learning from uh, the the teacher, which is you. So that's this is your influence. I know you're not a fourth line, but this is uh, me doing my best to uh, to you know to take what I've uh, yeah. What can I say? You're an inspiration. Nice, dude. Yeah, that that's awesome. Um, well, you did it. You, good job. You're like actually making cool stuff. Thank you. I feel like I should have a cup of coffee or something. I feel like I'm just so low energy. I'm not going to be a good presence, you know, like either that or we just talk about something that that gets me kind of jazzed up or something. I don't know. I mean, you're the generator. Are you drinking coffee? What are you drinking? Peppermint tea. Ah, nice. I never drink coffee after I'm done with my coffee. Uh, not these days. I'm like, like I, I, I finished drinking coffee at like nine or ten in the morning. <laughs> that's probably a good way to do it. I mean, that's definitely healthy. I feel like I'm in an emotional I'm looking low. through some notes. I'm yeah, I'm solar plexus really? undefined, but I feel like I'm in a low. Is that just melancholy? There's but there's not even individual going on. Can undefined people also have lows? Do they just do we just go through is it just mood? Do I just get moody? Cuz I don't have a defined solar plexus, but I just feel kind of moody. I don't know. Just you know, I don't want to blame defined solar plexus people for my emotional state. I think we all need to do things to feel good. And we all need to do things to put ourselves in a good mood. You know, um, we all need to like exercise and like do, do the things that, you know, kind of boost or just make you feel good. And also, I mean, as, as Mike is always saying, you can really savor any emotional state, even melancholy. Um, maybe I'm just feeling a little bit melancholy. Um, you know, that, that could be part of it. Do you differentiate between, I mean, I guess your emotional, you have emotional wave that is 1222, but you also have a 3536 wave or you kind of have two waves or you have one wave that just spikes sometimes with melancholy. How does that work for you? <laughs> with mel melancholy. Yeah. And anger. Don't forget anger. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm mad that I have but, so much uh, melancholy. <laughs> I actually heard Ra talking about what happens when you have multiple waves and he said that if you have the individual wave will mutate the other wave so i'll be 
they'll just they're part of they just combine into one crazy stupid thing so i'll be you know in my i'll be in my plateau and then i'll peak and go up to a different level and then the collective wave will crash way down and then i'll go even further down and then i'll come back up and then i'll plateau for a long time and then the then some experiential thing will happen and i'll start climbing up the thing and it'll plateau and keep climbing. it's it's crazy it's just crazy it's just mm. crazy i see so it really is kind of um, uh -huh. like the way it's i used to one think of thing it, kind of well it's one thing but then i've heard a couple of ways of explaining it one is that and especially between the root and the solar plexus multiple channels there but maybe other ones too i wonder they can get into like a fixing pattern where it looks like the person isn't emotional at all like say they have 4130 and they have 1949 or i've even met people that have 4130 and 1949 and 3955 all three mm -hmm. and they just look extremely neutral and so i've wondered is that because one wave has to move a little bit but it's kind of being held back from moving too far because the other wave has to go through its process you know, if each wave is like trying to reach clarity or trying to reach truth, are they kind of holding each other back? Now, the other thing that I thought is, um, I think it's in Channels by Type, where Ra talks about, say you have a tribal wave and a collective wave, the tribal wave just wants to settle down with that person and marry them. The collective wave wants to, um, you know, love, desire, enter, and leave. I think those were the keynotes. Or they end up hating burning exiting and staying and those are the worst kind of relationships for a collective people relationship where they've exited but they've stayed in the relationship like you know what i mean like the, your 35 36 is kind of meant in some way to like get on to the next if you're going to be in the same relationship with the same person with 35 36 it has to go through phases it has to kind of almost be like like continuing to to evolve and, and change but if a tribal like doesn't want to evolve and change like change is scary for tribal they're like let's keep it the same so i think what he was saying in channels by type is it can kind of confuse it and you know with like 35 36 you want to just have this adventure but you end up marrying that person or the person you end up maybe you're going to marry you end up having the adventure with it kind of just gets mixed up a little bit the tribal and the collective get mixed up so i remember him he said in channels by type that the tribal wave if you have both tribal and collective that the tribal wave is reliant on, like is comfortable with this predictability and this pattern to their wave and that the collective wave comes in and crashes and it just fucks everything up and it's just like the most the worst thing that could happen to this tribal wave because it's just like so just wants everything to be you know in order and logical and not logical it's the wrong keynote but you know well, like just I, I predictable and yeah it like, wants st stable in some way it's a stable wave even though it's rising and falling it's like rising and falling in a stable way so and the collective is just kind of woo something new and so let's go on something next and something different and yeah and i've also heard people say that the collective wave is not especially the 35 36 is not particularly emotional interesting Just that it's the like experiential is not necessarily emotional like it's it can i i have i have two i don't have i also have 12 22 so it's hard for me to say but i can sort of see that to where it's sort of like a cold wave you know it's like mm. it's not well, and it's also, it's not, I guess, the yeah, the collective, I guess it just depends, like, or kind of, it's interesting to see where both individual and collective end up is in the throat, and they basically end up with these manifestor channels where tribal doesn't, it ends up in the ego, and how different that is. If you see them all three coming from the root, 4130 to then 3635, 3955 to 1222, those end up in the throat. Those end up basically with manifestor channels that are kind of here to separate or to leave, or they're not always, they're not like union. Whereas if you look at 
3740, it's like you end up with the family. You end up with being part of something bigger than you, the community. And mm. Is that your cat opening the door? Is that... I just saw the door open. Actually, I think it's the wind. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I also like looking at the love gates, and it's interesting because when you look at those three streams from the root to the solar plexus and then going to the throat or the ego, you see the love gates in different places depending on the stream. So for tribal, the love gate is at the end. 40 is the love gate. You get the love at the end. 1949, 37, 40. The love comes at the very end where you just support each other and you get married and you do everything. It's like the love comes after marriage, right? The love is what where you end hmm. up with. The love of helping each other and working and that love of 40. It's like you get there by going through this whole tribal process. Meanwhile, you look where the love is for the individual. That's the emotional love. That's the only one that has a love gate in the emotional center, the solar plexus. 3955, well, 55 is the love gate. 1222, there's no love there. All the romance, there's no love in that. The love is in 55, and individual is the only stream that has a love gate in the solar plexus. So it's like the love of love, the love of the emotional feeling, the love of the intoxication of being in love. And then you get to 30, sorry, 4130, and then, you know, 36, 35, the love is at the very beginning in gate 41. And so with gate 41, it starts with the love in the root, it's like the pressure to love. And the love is like the excitement or the love, the fantasy of, I wonder what it's like, I, you know, what would it be like to go to this country? What would it be like to, and then that kind of fuels the whole process. So it's just interesting to see where the love is with the tribal process. You get the love at the end after the marriage and the coupling and the loyalty and with the, yeah. I haven't messed with love gates very much. I don't, I don't know what they, I don't have them memorized or anything like that. Well, in the three, um, you know, in the tribal, the individual and the collective streams of sexuality that go through the solar plexus, the love gates are 40, 55 and 41. And then there's interesting keynotes that you can get from those where, um, like I was saying earlier, like the keynotes Ra came up with for 3635, it's a binary. You either enter and leave or you exit and stay. And entering and leaving is what it's supposed to be. Basically, you, you bond, you have you bond for a day or a week or a month, but then you eventually leave. Whereas exiting and staying is like you're no longer having sex, you're no longer really, but then you're sticking around. That's like when the 36, 35 is really on its other side of the polarity, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, all of the, the sexual streams have polarities, which I guess we're not supposed to say they're good and bad with, you know, no moralistic judgment, but people tend to be one, they, they kind of want to be on the one side and not the other. I mean, there is a way that they're designed and you're going to get either one or the other. You're going to like get the healthy one where it's kind of like designed to continue moving on if it's collective, which can be moving on with the same person. I know a 3635 manifester who's been married to his childhood sweetheart, I want to say like 35 or 40 years. And you know what they do? They travel all over the world. They're constantly having new experiences together. And I did a, a little reading for him actually, and I, I was kind of telling him about it and saying, yeah, usually this is one that, you know, needs a lot of new experiences. And, you know, you don't really have any tribal circuitry here. You really just have this collective. And he's like, well, well and she has tribal. She's a 4521 manifester. But still, he said, well, the secret to having a good relationship is to keep it exciting, keep it new. They're always going someplace new. So kind of an interesting side of it definitely interesting <laughs> because i've never i'd never um figured all that out <laughs> the um the long-lasting relationship thing well you have the the 1222 which is like unrequited love and romance and you know love letters and all sorts of stuff with that i mean i have 12 so i've been envious of 1222s because always kind of wished I had that uh, 22 but but then I would be a split definition manifesting generator so I guess I'm glad I'm a single def sacral generator instead yeah I mean you 
just would not be anything like you are. Yeah, exactly. No, it's funny. When I first got into human design, I wished I had all of these other gates and channels and wished I was so different. And over time, I guess that's what they mean by self-love is you start to really enjoy the configuration you have. And you're like, hey, it's just yeah, like, I'll think about cool. like, man, if, it, if I only had like one of my bridge gates, like which one would I want to have? And it'd just be like, would there be a fucking single definition? I don't want to be single definition. They're second relationships. Split deaf knows knows how to, you know, knows how to relate, knows how to compromise, knows how to work with people. Single deaf, the moment yeah, you have um, a compromise, you're just like, there's someone else out there I don't have this compromise with, you know. Yeah, I was talking about someone about this today. Like, what, how, how, how? What do you think the process is? Like, when, you know, supposedly we we choose what our design is going to be, or at least we agree to it before we come, according to, you know, what's been said and such. But like, I mean, I suppose it's not an actual like weighing of options, you know, it's more like uh, you're just drawn to something because you don't have the self-reflected consciousness to like go through all of that yeah i mean i think probably the sense of time right it's kind of like it's an anthropomorphized thing and i don't even know if ra said we choose i mean he'll have to say no choice you know he probably would say we didn't choose to be born but i think it, it, it ultimately like the the question of like did we choose our life or not is kind of an anthropomorphization because like you're saying it's neither because to choose or to not choose requires some sort of self-reflected consciousness and when we're disincarnate, we don't have these brain systems that give us that experience. So it's very just mechanical in some way. And so there's a mechanism of selection. Now, I personally like to anthropomorphize it that we, we choose. But, um, you know, someone like Mark Germain, who's like Mr. No Choice. I, I want to get him a hat that just says Mr. No Choice on it because that's... Uh, he's like, he loves to say no choice to everything. And I mean, of course no choice said the voice. I mean, there is no choice, but there are ways of interpreting no choice where it's kind of like you're punching someone in the shoulder, like quit punching me and like no choice, you know? No, obviously we have some amount of something that can, you know, it's like, there's no choice. You're on the plane. The plane's going to go to its destination. You can't really choose where the plane's going, but you have a choice to like get up and jump up and down in your seat and be obnoxious or just like hang out and talk to somebody. Right. I see sometimes I'll say it's like skiing down a hill and you're, you can like go like this and go like that and go around the tree and like talk to your friend and take this hard route or this easy one or whatever it is. But eventually you're just going to end up at the bottom of the hill. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's an interesting, I mean, the whole no choice thing for me, I just want to know what people mean by it because it can mean so many different things. Like if you mean like ultimately there's no choice. Okay, sure. I mean, at, but that's also like saying there's no choice doesn't really make a difference. If you just are, if, if you're, if like the way I take it when Rob was saying this is he says the greatest vanity for humans is thinking we have a choice. So what he's saying no choice about is basically the context of disarming humans from their vanity or like humbling us. And so he wants to humble people so that they will follow strategy and authority because if they're humbled and if they wake up and go, oh my God, I really didn't have a choice in any of this. If I just sit still as a generator, it's just going to come to me. And the more that I'm waiting to respond to something that comes to me, the better prepared I am so that when it does come, I don't miss it. Whereas when I'm going around initiating all the time, the same thing comes to me. I had no choice it would come or not, but I just totally screwed it up and m missed it. That's how I take no choice, you know, or like you have no choice that as a manifester, how you're designed, but when you inform, you get less resistance. When you don't inform, you get more resistance. 
it's you still end up kind of doing the same things or going to the same places like no choice to me is actually much more mystical than just some truism of there's no choice man doesn't really matter anyway it's like it's not like this kind of flippant no choice dismissal the way i see it is more um you're only going to get a certain amount of opportunities for relationships in your life you're only going to get a certain amount of opportunities to really shine in your life and fulfill your life purpose you don't have a choice to like create new opportunities where they didn't exist. So when you're living according to your strategy and authority, you're kind of making every one of those count in some way. And yeah, mm -hmm. you can, if you don't live according to strategy and authority, you can say, well, yeah, no choice. We did the best we could to try to do that. But the, see, the, the whole thing for me, like it, there's two meanings of no choice. One is just why bother because it's all predetermined anyway. And I don't think Ra, he, sometimes he uses it that way, but that's like, if you're like not going to get human design, then he's like, well, no choice. You're not going to get it anyway. Who cares? But then his other meaning of no choice is basically like, we need to humble ourselves and realize that we don't, we're designed a certain way. We don't get to choose how we're designed. We don't get to choose who we are. We can either live that design or we can struggle against it. So the only real choice we have is this choice to like resist everything and go against and like basically screw everything up. Like anytime we try to exert this freedom of the mind to interfere. Um, and you know, so he's really urging us to not interfere with life. And those are kind of two different meanings because one is saying, well, it doesn't matter anyway, who cares, better luck next life. And he does use them in both ways. It's kind of like, which raw are you getting? The nihilistic, dismissive raw, who's just like, no choice, better luck next life. Right. Or the raw who's like trying to wake you up. He's like, you have no choice. This is who you are. So why don't he, you make he, the best? He of it? points out the irony of it. I mean, he's like, and obviously I'm sitting here telling you you have no choice and telling you how to make decisions at the same time. <laughs> yeah. This entire thing is about making decisions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, right. I had a quote years before I got into human design, years and years, I came up with this quote and it was because I was just really tripping out on free will and choice and all this stuff. And I said, decisions made as free will. I think I actually said volleys sent as free will come raining down as fate. And so my idea was in the first part of life, you have more free will. And then in the second part, because you have more freedom of movement, like you're skiing down that hill and you have like more ability to move, but every decision you make in the early part of your life sends these volleys like arrows and then they come raining down. Once you've let that arrow go, you can't control where that arrow is going. You shot those arrows out years ago and then those arrows all rain down as fate on the second half of your life. And so this was long before uh, the human design. I was just kind of like, yeah, like people, the older they get, the more fate they have because it's like the repercussions of their actions from when they were younger that have set wheels in motion that they can no longer control. And they have no choice sure. in, in trying to, you know, um, they can't control those those wheels. Those wheels are in motion, right? So, so anyway, yeah, and they, they like set their trajectory a long time ago. And now it's like that little, that little adjustment has set them like way over here. And then yeah. they're, and they're trying to exert so much free will to like undo it or something, but they can't undo it because once you've loosed those arrows, those arrows are flying through the air. And, you know, you could have been 16 years old when you shot that arrow. It doesn't come back down to the ground until you're 50 or 60. And or you've so, just been avoiding it your whole life and it, you know, and that just creates more and more problems. Yeah. But I sort of, I sort of get it. I sort of do think of it as like a, a pretty literal, no free will kind of thing. Because the way that when Ra, the thing that really lands for me is when he says that, that free will is an illusion. It's not that you don't have it. It's just, that it's an illusion it's like it's like painted on afterwards it's like it the it, we're in this we see time as being linear and so it all has to make sense and like free will is part of how we make sense of things but 
we don't necessarily have it. I mean, we we get to experience it as like, and then I had this idea and it was great and I decided to go do the thing and that's how this happened. But it could just be happening retroactively. Like, I don't know. Well, and that this is what it could easily Germain just always, be no free yeah. will at all. This is what Mark Germain always brings up is that scientists have proven that if you tell somebody to arbitrarily make a choice between, say, colors, they can tell you've made the choice a full half second before you click the button because it's like red, green, blue. And like you get like in the brain is like blue. And then you're like blue. And then they're like, when did you choose blue? When I clicked the button. That doesn't carry any weight for me because if you're just saying that the, the brain has already made a choice before the finger clicks the button, that's still a choice. So the real question is, is it all predetermined? And for that, when people say it's before you even realize you've made the decision. Exactly. The brain has already fired in the synapses, but I'm saying that's just moving the goalpost. And suddenly the brain has made the choice before you, the conscious mind, but then still a choice has been made. A selection has been made by the brain. So the real question is, could it have chosen differently? Well, I mean, this is the interesting idea. And there's a guy named R.S. Baker who does blind brain theory. And he's a huge proponent of fatalism, which just says, you know, the brain has already decided and the brain couldn't decide any other way because it's deciding based on a biochemical reaction. Then you have people like Stuart Hameroff who say, no, there's a tremendous amount of indeterminacy in the brain. In fact, Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose argue that the human brain has quantum states that collapse and that the collapse of a quantum state cannot predict, you can't predict ahead of time in that quantum superposition, which side it will go to. So that almost is like a sort of evidence of something like free will in the brain, even if the conscious mind doesn't necessarily have it. See what I'm saying? The conscious mind that says, I made this choice could be totally wrong, but the brain still was in a quantum state of superposition that collapsed, and we still couldn't predict which side it would collapse on ahead of time, which is basically our definition of choice. I'm not saying that either argument is so compelling, but one compelling argument from a human design perspective is simply that Ra, when he talks about the reason for everything in this unborn living entity, this fetus that we're in, that is the whole universe, and how we eventually evolve to be the Aeron, he basically says this entire experiment with self-reflected consciousness is an experiment in learning how to make decisions. And that's an interesting point, too, because why would it be an experiment in learning how to make decisions if we, it was all predetermined, right? If everything was predetermined until the end of time. And I see what you're saying where you're like, well, from one perspective, time is linear. From another, all time has already happened. But I don't know that that's a difference that makes a difference in the sense that... I'm just saying it could be the yeah. way that this works just the illusion of it free could will. be yeah it absolutely could be all time could have already happened and we could just be watching a playback of it but it still raises the question of well the word already doesn't doesn't count in that exactly it's kind of like like we start to get into these interesting questions where i saw there was a group of scientists who had a whole youtube video on what was before the beginning of time and i'm like that's just a wrong question because you can't have a before until you experience time because before you re relies on time as a so these are all really interesting questions i have time a and light need to coexist that's a good point that's a good point and you know that light photons are the most ubiquitous the most uh the the greatest number of or the most mass in the entire universe is from photons which is interesting maybe not mass but the most ubiquitous particle Right, because they don't have, I guess, the be, before neutrinos. Yeah, then the neutrinos. So let's take a yeah. short break. I'm going to dig up this cool image that's old school raw. I always like finding the old school raw. And you may have seen it. I'll find it and then I'll share my screen. Wait, wait, old, where, <laughs> there's the, one of the two different hats he wore. Yeah. It's the hat types. The right, well, he changed, he changed, right, he changed from his mystical hat to his baseball cap when it was found that mm -hmm. neutrinos had mass, yeah, which Indeed. was something he, he had predicted. Okay, well, we'll be right back. Thank you so much, Dave Myers, Emotional Manifester, Neutrino Radio on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. 
and we will be right back with part two. So we are back for part two. I'm with my guest, Dave Myers, Neutrino Radio. Ooh, you have your uh, tea. I do. I have my tea right here. Yeah, this is a... We have our tea. Our tea. This is a Tulsi Sweet Rose tea. It's very delicious. Did you know that Tulsi is, is basil? Yeah, it's really good. I had no idea. It's really good. So I, uh, continuing in on our topic of no choice, I dug up this interesting graphic, this vintage raw graphic, and a uh, lot to unpack here. Really, a lot to unpack. As you can see, um, there is no choice, but then choices. So. It's kind of, to me, this is explaining how both are needed, that no choice doesn't even make sense without the concept of choice. And you can be like, oh, well, this is the real one. Okay, well, then this is the fake one, but the real and the fake one still make up reality, like, together, somehow. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I'll just leave this up <laughs> I'll leave this up here for a little while because I think this might be an interesting jumping off point. So I said my my quote um, in the first half, I said, or the first section, we'll see how many of these we do. Uh, I said my quote was, volleys sent as choice rain down as fate. Meaning like what we chose sent these, you know, arrows that then rain down as fate later. I have another one. This is another quote, uh, pre-human design Jonah Dempsey quote. And it is, um, intentions mean everything before you act, nothing after. And by that, I mean, do you, do you have any impression of that? Intentions mean everything before you act, nothing after. <laughs> okay well hey you're not here to respond I mean, that's you're like not... i mean no i i it's what is it like it's, it's it's meant to be sort of a one hand clapping thing no right? no well my okay my interpretation of what i mean when i say that is basically after you've acted your intentions are um only going to be retroactively applied where you say i never meant to hurt you i never meant to cause you pain i never meant this i never meant that you know after the action the um the attestation of good intentions is really just an excuse to get to kind of justify bad behavior right so it's kind of only if you no that's not how's that true <laughs> okay well first of all you're just talking about <laughs> okay I mean, first of all you it's only it's more like you it it doesn't matter what you say after you've done it because you yeah. just did it anyways but that just has to do with what you say not with what you mean to do well it's i like guess my point is yeah it's kind of like state your thing. intentions before your actions and then follow through with them I guess I'm trying to say like you free could. will turns into fate or something. Free will, what starts as free will becomes fate. What starts as intentions after the action occurs, retroactively we have to erase the intentions from ever having existed. Because if you start to say, well, I had the best of intentions, then that becomes an excuse. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't have the best of intentions. That's why I say intentions mean everything before you act, nothing after. So it's like... If you say, well, intentions are just fake anyway, intentions are just things we use to justify our actions by saying what we meant to do, which is a very nihilistic kind of materialist stance that just says, you know, there's no such thing as an intention. We're just using that to justify our actions. Well, that's that to me is wrong because intentions are very important. If I interview you and I have a bad intention and my intention is to be uncharitable towards you or unkind towards you or unhospitable towards you, 
that's a bad intention. And, you know, but I should have the best of intentions. I want to celebrate you and enjoy and, you know, have great conversations and, you know, and express how much I, I love talking to you and all these things. But then if after we have this conversation, you're like, man, Jonah was a real jerk. He made me feel like crap today. And I'm like, I didn't mean to make you feel like crap. Well, that's just an excuse. If I did, then, you know, maybe, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is psychoanalysis teaches us we don't always know our intentions. So we can strive to intend something, but later if I make you feel really bad, maybe I intended to make you feel bad without realizing it. Or maybe my intention to not make you feel bad was just a cover or a ruse covering up some animosity. I guess this is why I'm saying like the action itself is a changing point where the free will turns to fate or where the intention is basically, it basically is an act of self erasure of the intention. It's kind of like the weird paradox you get into where like a therapist, you really need the therapist until you're, you, you get to the point where you don't need them anymore. So they helped you get to the point where they cannot help you. And so there's kind of like an act of self erasure of the therapist themselves because the final step is no longer needing them. The intention only exists until the action occurs, at which point it erases itself so that you can't be like, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to do this instead. I never meant for that to happen. You know, it's kind of, um, yeah. It, ugh, okay. <laughs> That's like a time travel paradox or something. I, I don't even, I can just almost, almost grasp it. But that's kind of what free will and fate are, right? Because it's almost a time tra time travel paradox where what starts as free will becomes fate because what you started as a choice to do something becomes what always happened, which you have no choice about the fact that it happened. I guess, I'm, I mean... Oh my God. I, I don't know. We can, we can get back away from this. I'm just going to show... No you. choice, Jonah. No choice, okay? No choice. No choice in the absolute. No choice, Marty McFly. <laughs> no choice in the absolute. So I just like this. I am awareness here now self-consciousness. Whereas this says collective intelligence because of collective experience, this or that. And this is the fully yin and this is the fully yang. And it's kind of a yin yang because you see that I don't know if the colors are that significant if Ra was thinking that far ahead, but on the design side, we have this kind of, you know, this is like the eye. This is like the yin eye of yang, and this is like the yang eye of yin. Anyway. When they're in their trigrams. Okay, right. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> was that it was like from that's one of the the graphics that like you should be able to look at while you're listening to one of the lectures that you've listened to like 17 times and it's like the whole time that was the graphic that you had no idea what he was talking about. Yeah, that does happen where he refers to the graphic and then uh, you know, it's just an MP3. So, well, I, I returned to some raw lectures. I don't know if I ever listened to one 17 times, but I definitely returned to them. I mean, certain ones I go back to where I, they're just like, there's a comfort in them or I just, yeah. I mean, I, I just enjoy God listening to raw. He really, I, st I get so much out of it. I mean, you never stop getting stuff out of it. That's what's crazy. It's like, there's some people that you can just kind of endlessly read. I mean, Carl Jung is still like that for me. I still get a lot from Carl Jung and there's other people too. It's not just Rob, but he's really, he's up there. For me, it's just Rob. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> no Jung, no, uh, yeah. Even still, I, I overdo it. Like I, I overconsume and then I can't listen to him for months and then I overdo it again. Yeah, I get on little binges. You know, when I was just visiting you in Austin, I was on that um, card kick, 
Cards of Destiny kick. And you're like, God, at least Jonah's not talking about reincarnation. But now he's talking about playing cards? What is this? You know, we, you're we just still you doing it, aren't you? You're still into it. Yeah, just as but much that was kind of peak. That was here. like, that was pretty peak for me. Like, I, I'm definitely still doing it, but that was definitely like peak card time for me. For those who don't know what we're talking Glad about. Glad I was uh, there during that part of your life. <laughs> Thank you. You were there to, uh, well, and for those who don't know, I mean, the cards are actually, it's funny because I always think human design is such a rare, exotic, I mean, not so much anymore. Like when I got into human design, nobody knew about it. Now I feel like nobody knows about the cards. I mentioned the cards and they're like, oh, you mean tarot? I'm like, no, cards of destiny, cards of the magi, you know, love cards, cards of truth. Like it has all these different names and, it, and nobody really knows what I'm talking about. But uh, playing cards. And then they go, playing cards? You're into playing cards? You know? I, I don't think people I mean, like there's playing a certain cards. Amount of, there's a certain amount of crossover with the tarot to begin with. Like I've definitely seen, I think I even have a tarot deck that is like pretty much just a playing card deck but that's for readings and then i don't know it's like i think that people are less wowed by by another card thing than they are by like a mechanical aura system you know no human design is definitely it has a big wow factor but the fun thing for the cards see i have a hard time I have a hard time guessing people's channels and gates and sometimes I do, but you know, sometimes I'll be like, wow, you're really healthy. You must be undefined spleen. And then they're like totally packed spleen. I'm like, well, okay, I guess that made sense because I'm just, I'm just picking up on that. But I mean, you know, I can't really predict the centers that well. Sometimes I can't. Did I, did I tell you my center prediction? You told me about that, that parlor trick thing. That, that happened only you. happened once. And I don't want to do it again. Cause I don't want to, like I have a, right now I have a 100% track record, <laughs> but I was in Seattle about six months ago and my, my buddy who's, he's like into human design, but he's into it cause it infected him. You know, like those people, he's like begrudgingly into it. And so he, like, cause I basically been telling him about it, but I, I even kind of stopped telling him about it, but it was already too late. It like got in. So he knows enough human design that now he's just like ruined for life he's like he first learned it about seven years ago and um he's a manifesting generator two five and so it's so funny is like i mean he he came to the pura vita retreat in costa rica like he's into human design you know what i mean he's one of these people who's like a scientific rationalist skeptic who's like yeah whatever ra ra ru ru that's what he calls ra he's like oh he's still into that ra ra ru ru guy and you know he loves to make fun of it but then at the end of the day i'm like why didn't you do that he's like didn't respond to it <laughs> or, you know, or he'll just be like, nah, <laughs> like he just, he follows his sac sacral response. But anyway, he loves to just, just be a shit kicker. And so I was at his house and he was living with this doctor who's like incredibly smart, um, 28 years old, you know, I mean, a 28 year old doctor, these are smart people. These are like type A, like go get them. Like they, they spent 500 K on their, you know, they're going to get their damn money's worth, you know, and they're going to be doctors and they don't have time for mysticism and all this crap. And so my buddy Johnny is going like, Hey Jonah, you should do a reading for my housemate. I'm like, he's not interested in that. You know, I, I learned in my first year of human design to just shut up about it. That was one of my first experiments was not to volunteer. People are like, Oh yeah. Well, people are like, what's that person's design? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, you've known them for six years. I'm like, I never asked. Like that is that is like me living my design is like not initiating with my undefined head in Ajna. Like I will go yes. to my grave not knowing what the name of that actor was. You know what I mean? Whereas before human design, I would look up everything and try to figure out everything and solve it. So I'm like, come on, Johnny, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And then of course he starts hearing it. And it's like, as a generator, we can't really hide it. Like it's in our aura, you know, he's like, what's this you guys are talking about? Oh, what's this human design stuff? Well, I want to know. Well, he starts challenging me more and more and like hours go by, he's drinking and it's getting to be like 1 AM. And finally he's like, look, if human design is real, you should be able to ask me a few simple questions about each center 
I haven't seen this chart yet. You should be able to tell me exactly what centers I have or not. And I had a whiteboard at that point because, you know, he's a doctor. He pulled out a whiteboard and we're kind of scribbling on it. And so I made a body graph and I'm like, OK, well, um, let's start with the ego. Do you feel like you have anything to prove? And he's like, never, nothing to prove. Never try to convince anyone of anything. Never prove anything. And I'm like, undefined ego. And he's like, wait a minute. Don't didn't you say that the like he's kind of like. I'm like, you seem like you're trying to prove something right now. You're trying to prove that. And like, he's like, didn't you say that the undefined ego is the not self is always trying to prove? And I'm like, yeah, you're trying to prove to me that you never prove anything. We did this for each of the nine, like each of the nine. And we figured out he had root, sacral, spleen, and G center. Those were the four that he had. And the other five were open or undefined. And those were the four that I didn't like get not self themes from. Like, I just didn't like, you know, those were the four that were just kind of, I believed him when he's like, oh yeah, I just let go of things so they don't work. And I'm like, I can tell you do. Like, you, you just kind of don't really care as much, you know, like the defined spleen, I could pick up on that. Like, he seemed like he didn't like hold on to a lot of resentments and hold on to a lot of things. And, and so each of those, and so we did it. And then we looked at his chart and he was just like, holy shit, how did you do that? I will never do it again. <laughs> that was a nine out of nine, uh, you know, that's like flipping. A I mean, don't you want to try it some more? I mean, without the pressure of somebody like yeah, challenging but it's, you. Like it, but it's also kind of shitty because it's kind of like it only really works if they're like really aggressively like trying to prove they're not self themes like. I don't know. Like, I feel like if it wasn't in that adversarial circumstance, I wouldn't have picked up on his undefined ego because the undefined ego would have just been chill. But because he was in that adversarial threatening way. So I didn't like it that much. It didn't really make me feel good after. But it was interesting that we were able it was it was just like flipping a quarter and getting nine heads. You know, it was kind of just like or like, you know, what's much more rare is your three darts on the 60. Come on. 180. For those who don't know, Dave got a 180 on darts, and wow. It's a, something you can, a skill you can develop. Skill well, develop. yeah, probably the, so. Is, so is guessing people's people centers. Who, <laughs> yeah. sure. but they're, 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 how they're, about they're, just guessing type? Like, how about how do you feel about guessing people's type? It's so hard. Do you feel it's, like you've, over no, these it's... years, you've gotten good at it at all? No, it's really hard to do. I, I don't really do it anymore. But when I used to, I would always like confuse like a five one with really magnetic eyes for like a projector, you know, and I'd be like, wow, you have like these brilliant eyes. You must be a projector. And they'd be like a five one generator. I mean, I, I have projector eyes. Come on. I mean, it's like more people have projector eyes than projectors. Like it's not really, you can't really, that's not a good metric. Like Oh, wow, like I'm looking deeply into your eyes and you must be a projector. No, I mean, there's a lot of things that'll cause that. Um, so it's it's hard. For right. It's, but it's there's a certain yeah. there's certain projectors that you just know are projectors. I feel like the, sometimes when there's, I see them locking, especially. In, yeah. And also men who are projectors are easier to spot because really? they're they've got that starry eyed sort of like there's a there's a different there's a different vibe it's the eyes for sure and the ponytail usually they have ponytails but um was it you who pointed out that all these reflectors either have a shaved head or long hair so i think it, no. you pointed that, no somebody pointed out at the you didn't you say the long hair that's I good though you. that's good i swear it was you it was at the hdhd conference last year and you were like these projectors all have long hair because they can't make up their mind Oh, I thought you said reflectors. Oh, reflectors. No, I, that's what I meant. Reflectors. Didn't you say that? Didn't you say that about reflectors? Oh. Okay. No, I yeah. didn't. I wish I had, though. I don't, it's, I don't it's know. the kind of generalization I like to make. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, one thing I like about the cards is that I do guess the cards more readily than I guess type or profile. You know what I mean? Like, I can guess the cards... Because, I mean, the cards are these kind of characterizations of people. Like, I can guess people's personality types pretty well. Myers-Briggs types. That's not even really guessing. That's just called assessment. I assess their type. I can assess people's Enneagram type pretty well, usually. 
you're still a little bit, I'm still on the fence a little bit with you. Like I haven't totally figured out, are you a four wing five? Are you a five wing four? I'm in the general neighborhood. Like I'm kind of figuring out what Enneagram you are. And some people I take a really long time to, to figure out, but a lot of people I'm just like, oh yeah, you're a seven, like obviously, or oh yeah, you're a one. Like I recognize my own. Did you ever get into Enneagram? Is that something you got into? No. Okay. No. Well, you don't have to get into everything. You What's know? the difference between a four and a five? Fours are all about being individual. So they really want to be different from everyone else. And they want to be kind of exotic and different. And generally speaking, they feel okay and comfortable when they're in pain. And when other people are in pain, because authenticity is so important to them and pain doesn't lie. So they know that they're in touch with the authenticity of truth when they're in pain and they don't want to be lulled into a false sense of safety of like a good life or a happy life because they're like, ah, I'm getting too happy. I might be like full of shit now. Like they're, they're eternally paranoid of becoming like sell out corporate full of shit people. So they want to, I'm definitely not too happy. So. <laughs> yeah. But they really want to keep a healthy dose of pain because branding. that makes them know that they're in touch with something real. It's like, I'm in touch with the, like, there's a lot of, I mean, there's different. Right. I mean, I, I'm constantly miserable. So <laughs> okay, that, well, that, that sounds pretty poor. But then here's the five. And the thing is, they're adjacent. So there can be a four wing five, there can be a five wing four. Four is associated with Neptune. I know you're also a Pisces. But I wouldn't want that to get in the way because there are people who aren't Pisces who are also fours. Um, five is associated with Uranus. And five is basically the thinker who learns every last thing about you know, fives will tell you about sturgeon breeding patterns in the Caribbean or in some particular region. They'll tell you about a particular kind of beetle in Madagascar that, and how all the inner, I mean, fives are like the zoom in people who just zoom in. People think I'm a five a lot and I'm not, I'm a one, but people confuse me for a five. They're like, Jonah, you're a classic five. You know so much. Well, knowing a lot is not, it, it is a five trait, but anyone can know a lot. And fives tend to know... I don't know shit, so I'm a four. <laughs> okay. But the five... The other reason I think you're a four is you don't seem to shy away from emotion. Fives basically... Four says, I'm okay if I'm in pain. You're okay if you're in pain. Five says, I'm okay if I'm not feeling. You're okay if you're not making me feel. So the five is almost allergic to feeling. Like if you want to make a five really uncomfortable, I'd be like, Dave, you know what? You're just so special. Like you've inspired me so much and you mean so much to me. And I just really like you and I care about you. And like a five would be like, shut the fuck up, get out of here. <laughs> you know, they would, they I would do find that a little annoying, but yeah. yeah I but you that. could be a four wing mm -hmm. five. The four wing five is called the Bohemian is its nickname. The five wing four is the iconoclast. So Andy Warhol was a five wing four. David Lynch is a five wing four. Basically four and five is the most avant garde. So that most people in the avant-garde are either four wing five or five wing four. They're somewhere in there. And I'm not, but I love the avant-garde and I have four wing five in my what's called tri-type. There's a theory that even if you're not a particular type, you have a secondary and tertiary type. One interesting thing is that Enneagram is split between three fundamental areas and they're called the head, the gut, and the heart. And the heart is kind of a shorthand for the solar plexus and the emotional system. The gut is very physical oriented and a shorthand for like the spleen. And the head is kind of a shorthand for the ajna. So really it's spleen, ajna, solar plexus. So if you take the body graph and you make that triangle of the body graph and the three awareness centers, those are the three fundamental centers in the Enneagram as well. So it does have some connections to human design. Um, what were you into before human design? Like, were you into any other system? <clears throat> um, no, not any time recently. Were you into astrology? Like, I like was definitely wasn't just like when I was, you know, as a, in my teens and my twenties, like I, but only to the extent that I like 
had a couple girlfriends who like were into it and my dad got into it um later on and then he's the one who who got found out what time i was born like he had to he sent away for my advanced birth certificate to like get to find out what time i was born so he could run my astrology chart um but i it was just enough to be like impress people you know be like i knew what my moon sign and my and my mercury and my venus and my mars were and my rising and that was enough to be like you know one step in on the on the astrology train but i just never actually got really that far into it so i'm not good at studying and learning shit i'm really really bad at it um but i mean i i messed around with tarot cards and when i was like in in high school and stuff and i but i was not looking for something like the human design came i was it wasn't like i was it finally like filled the hole i'd been trying to like fill my whole life it was it was just suddenly like oh this explains things like what what is it say what about manifestors like shit okay well I can do something with that. What are you talking about? Like, and it, you know, it wasn't like I didn't believe it that things like that existed. I just didn't give a fuck until it became this practical thing. And then I was like, oh, I'm doing this from now on. But it wasn't like, it was not like the result of a spiritual quest or anything. Right. You weren't searching for the Holy Grail and then going, oh my God, I found the Holy Grail. Right. Which for it was me, just like, what's this? It's a grail. What are, what's the grail? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I definitely cool. felt like right. I found, I felt like I found the Holy grail, but I was so greedy when I started with human design that my first year I thought I am going to be able to predict personality type from a human design chart because I was so, uh -huh. deep in, I was deep in Jungian type. I was deep in Myers-Briggs, which has 16 types. I had already developed a system I called MBTI 64, which was a 64 type system where each of the 16 types had four subtypes. Then I got into this thing called objective personality, where there's 32 subtypes of each of the, each of the kind of fundamental types for a total of 512. And I was like, I am going to figure out how to take a human design body graph based on a birth time and date and, and correlate it to personality type. And then as I got deeper into human design, I was like, that is the most undefined head Ajna shit ever. Hmm. And instead, I don't have to know this. I don't have to solve this. I can actually just like die easy knowing that I'm going to go to my grave, not knowing and not solving all these things that I really wanted to know and solve because that's not me. That's my conditioning of being a knower and a solver. And I'm not a knower or a solver. I'm not even even really a talker or a sharer in that sense. I mean, I do. It seems like I'm a big talker. You think but... you're a solver. You try to solve things. Well, I, I think about them, but I think about them softly in the same way that I share softly, where people are like, Jonah, you're undefined throat. You shouldn't talk so much. I'm like, yeah, but you can interrupt me anytime. Try interrupting a defined throat. Try interrupting, you know... You know, Alokanand Diaz, you are pretty good for a uh -huh. defined throat for like, you're pretty gentle in the, that department, but try interrupting Ra, you know, try interrupting Alok. Sure. You're not going to interrupt these people, but you can interrupt me at any point. You can just poke me and I'll go, oh, okay, what, what do we want to talk about now? I think of it more as the, right. uh, the undefined centers are just kind of gaseous. They're just kind of off gassing. And, you know, my undefined throat is just kind of a running commentary but it can shift at any time, anytime anything happens. It's like, I'm very flexible. It's more about a flexibility. It's like, oh, we're doing this now. Like, oh, we're being quiet now. Okay, I'll be quiet. Oh, we're talking now. Okay, I'll talk. And I know that I can get pretty amped up and blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, a good example is that plane ride back from Austin, I didn't say a single word. I didn't talk for eight hours straight. I sat next to somebody, interesting person. I can almost tell they wanted to talk to me a little bit. 
and I just was thinking of things. I was writing. I was I was actually writing my. Uh, I have all these pet project unfinished books, and I'm like fifty or sixty pages into my book on the cards of destiny now <laughs> that I'm writing. You're talking about writing, okay? Writing a sorry. book, yeah, not reading. <laughs> How many books you got going? I have no idea. They'll they'll never be done. I have an undefined throat, and I don't have the channel of struggle. You know, I, I need to like book time with Mike, my good friend Mike. Who you know, he has the channel of struggle. I need to book time to sit next to him to write, because writing is such a struggle, and I don't have that channel of struggle. I'm not here to struggle. Wasn't your your book that you've talked about for years is a is a bridge gate book? Is that correct? Oh, I did do the human design deconditioning guide that I started that has, it does have a section of it, which is how to interpret the bridging gates. And it has examples of what it's like if you have this or that bridging gate. But I would love for someone else to write that book because, I mean, I just, you know. It's You're not... the bridge gate guy as far as I know. Like, I don't know anyone else who gets as into bridge gates as you. I did a reading today uh, for someone who had Bridging Gate 20, Bridging Gate 13, and Bridging Gate 59. And I said, um, you can think they're a manifesting generator. They're a manifesting generator. So I said, you can have the illusion that you might find peace and satisfaction if only you get everything done now, Gate 20. And they also had an undefined route. So I'm like, the Gate 20 is a bridging gate. It's like, I have to do it now. And you might get really into Eckhart Tolle and all this power of now stuff. And like, I just have to get it done and I have to be in the present. And also though, with 13, um, making sense of the past and understanding how things got to be the way they are. And then also with 59, just having orgasms. You might just think, wow, if I just get the orgasm, I'll just, that'll be the satisfaction I'm looking for. That'll be the peace I'm looking for. And then you get it and then 20 minutes later, it's it goes away that it's a temporary fix you know and that's how i see those bridging gates but yeah it is funny like i didn't really synthesize those together like i don't know how to synthesize 20 and 13 and 59 but i do at least right. address them as like three different avenues i basically say the bridging gates are mirages that pretend to give you your signature but then once you get there you don't get your signature it doesn't actually what do you do when you see like a just a complicated chart like what it's like lots of channels and l things that loop back around and stuff like what do you i just when i look at something like that i just i don't know what to f i have no idea where to go like if i just see one channel i can kind of do like a one or two yeah. channels i can kind of i mean there, there's still going to be a type they're still going to have strategy and authority they're still going to have these simple things um but when you have a lot of channels it just makes them very specific in what they're here to do like i use mike as an example a lot he has 731 if he only had that he could be a logical leader in almost any situation but he also has 2838 so it has to be for something that's for a higher purpose like a martin luther king gandhi kind of thing they both had 2838. But then he also has 6124. So it has to be something mystical and esoteric and weird. And then he also has 1949. So it has to be in this sort of tribal connection. See what I'm saying? Each extra channel. Yeah, it's so complicated. Kind of, well, it's basically, it's like zooming in. Like if they only have one channel, they could do anything within this range. And then they have another one. Suddenly it cuts down their options for a job. Instead of a thousand jobs, they're only suitable for a hundred. Then they have another channel. Now they're only mm -hmm. suitable for 10. They have another channel. They're only suitable for one. And it's finding that one job that ticks all the boxes for all the different channels they have. It's the one job they're here to do. Let's take a short break. Do you have an Enya for okay. one more? Is it, you got, let, let, let's do one more. Little uh, we can, we can. We yeah, can let's keep, keep going. going. It's Friday night, hanging out. This is awesome. I feel like I'm back in Austin. I've been thinking about Austin nice. since I left. Austin got in my blood. It got under my skin. I'm like, I, I want to go back. I love Dude, it. When you were here, that was like, that was such a cool week. Like I had, I like, I had like a definite experiential crash afterwards like it was i kept thinking about things that happened and like all the 
I'm still thinking about it. I mean, I, I got back here like, and it's like, it was like lingered. In my 35 was just like, ooh, that was cool. <laughs> Same for me. I had such a blast and I was like, I already have a list of things I want to do next time I go there and more places to check out. And uh, yeah, so, okay, we'll take a short break. Yeah, you just and only we... got only the beginning. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we are back. I am here with Dave Myers, Neutrino Radio. So High Desert Human Design 2023. I'm pumped on it. I am very excited. Uh, I haven't made a lot of announcements yet because, you know, I'm a generator. I'm not a big announcer. I just like to build it. And then once it's built, I let people know this is what I built, you know, but I don't like to hype it up before it's been built. I like to kind of keep it under wraps. Um, but I can just say that what's been brewing is pretty exciting to me. So I really hope you'll join us. And I like hope... what, Jonah? <laughs> well, okay, here's an example. Uh, we're going to have... So this year, we have some big changes from last year. Last year was fun, but it was kind of chaotic. We had two stages. We had something like 30 or 40 talks. I don't even know, maybe 50 talks. I don't know. It was ridiculous. I lost count. This year, we're going to make it lighter on the talks and heavier on the experiential networking, right variable, you know, make it fun. And so just as an example, um, there's this guy, Romy, who is like this amazing Qigong expert elder of the community who is one of the people or the main person who created the Commodore computer, the Commodore 64. And he's just absolutely brilliant. And he's agreed to host an evening at his home, which is a beautiful home in the Santa Fe Hills. And we have Brandy Jordan and Danny Kilpatrick who are going to be doing um, a sound healing ritual there and you know, we're making it very experiential this time. Um, we have uh, Liliana Salas, who's going to be doing yoga. Um, there's a piano at the venue. I'm going to be performing. And maybe if others want to perform, uh, they can perform in between sets or you know, in, in, in for talks, rather. And we're just going to make it a lot lighter on the talks. We're going to do some special RSVP only events, which we did last year. We kind of experimented with it. Because uh, now we have about 100 people coming, so it's nice to have some breakouts into different groups. Um, did you do any of the RSVP events last year? Like, did you do the mezcal tasting or any of the... Yeah, it was kind of an I did. I did a scotch tasting with you. You did a scotch tasting. Okay, yeah. Did I do the mezcal little... also? I can't even remember if I did. <laughs> <laughs> we had natural wine tastings, mezcal tastings, and scotch tastings. I mean, it was... Yeah. You know what? I what... had fun doing that. That was That was like... One of my favorite things. And I honestly, like, I hate scotch. <laughs> okay. <But> I, like, <laughs> so you're just, I, I just like. Just new horizons. Well, there. I mean, it, well, since we were like, we were, we were sort of structuring it. It wasn't just like sitting there and like drinking, but it was like, actually, like you had to like identify. Oh yeah. We're serious about and undertones yeah. and stuff. And I was like, I'd never done a tasting like that before. So it was sort of like an introduction to tastings as well as, um, I don't know, like me just deciding to try scotch again. Cause I, 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 the only time I ever got arrested was because of scotch. Wow. And it was like way too much scotch, like way, way, way too much. And, wow. um, it, it, it sat with me for a couple of days and, um, and I just, I've never been able to, to, until, until your, your tasting, I had gone a good 18 years without uh, giving scotch another chance. Well, we probably drank a scotch that night that was first distilled the night you were arrested. So, you know, we were mostly doing uh -huh. Yeah. 
Well, one of my highlights last year was Trivia Night, and I want uh, to do another Trivia Night with you. That was a lot of fun. I think we can expand on it. We can... For sure highlight. Have a lot of fun with it. I don't remember too many <laughs> questions, but we had some good ones. I mean, they're, they're basically like raw trivia. I mean, it's human design trivia also. Yeah, it was all raw trivia. What That's does what raw call nature's urinals? Cacti. Projectors. Oh, <laughs> no. Cactus. Sorry. I just have to mess with projectors every once in a while. Yeah. Um, yeah, I still I have all those questions on my in my computer right now. Yeah. And we can come up with some new ones. And um, I mean, it's just it is HDHD is just so much fun. I really love it. And for anyone who's listening to this who hasn't gone, um, you should come. I mean, if you're into human design, if you're listening to this, you're obviously into human design and come. It's really fun. We have a total blast. It's uh, really affordable. It's, you know, Santa Fe Hostel is only 35 bucks a night for a private room. Very few destinations can you find a private room. I mean, I go to LA. It's like I can hardly get by 100 bucks a night. It's like 140 150 just for like a cheap That's motel. That's a good point. Austin That's has a, a few point. deals, I guess. Well, I just stay at friends' houses when I'm there. But but yeah, um, Santa Fe, it's a really special place. And the HDHD conference is just, especially this year, I mean, and I think in the future, moving forward, we're just going to kind of make it more experiential because the first year was really experiential. And then we really went heavy on packing as much content as possible for year two, which was your first year coming. But what ended up happening is, people just crashed out by the last day. People were so shredded. Like generators were shredded. It wasn't even a sacral thing. Generators were just it like, was overwhelming. Yeah, it, was, it was, yeah, they were so just much. done. It was like Sunday rolled around and we had a uh, potluck and like nobody went to the talks. They just went to the potluck because they were just so shredded that they just wanted to like, they've been drinking mezcal and scotch and natural wine for four days. And they'd been like running all mm -hmm. over Santa Fe and they'd been, you know, inundated with hour after hour of lectures. Well, also a lot of the speakers were burned out. Like yeah. the people doing it also were just kind of like had done several. Some of the people did more appearances than necessary. And yeah, I mean, it's like, just it was, you know, it we was aired on the side of maximalism. And now we're going to be a little more, uh, we're not going to be so heavy handed. And so, so this year we have a new venue. I'm really excited about it. Um, I just paid the deposit. It's all locked in. And we have it for the whole five days, which is nice, unlike the three days last time, because that also kind of forced us to compress it all, because we're like, well, we only really have three days of the venue. We better just jam pack it with talks. This is going to be different. Uh, we have it from nine to five every day. So we're going to have like nine to 10 will be like either morning meditation or yoga. But, you know, you optionally can show up for that, or the first talk will be at 10. Last year, I was doing talks at 9 a.m. every morning. I mean, that was already like, what? I kind of like the breakfast talks. That was nice. I, I might still do a couple. I was thinking what I'm going to do is, yeah, coffee with Jonah, or it could even be coffee with Dave and Jonah. And then, Ugh. or for people who want coffee and breakfast, they can come to that at Counterculture, which is like two blocks from the venue. Or they can go to the venue and do either a meditation or yoga. Then at 10 a.m., we have the first talk. The second talk won't be till like 1145 and we'll try to keep the talks to, you know, roughly an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And that way we actually have space between the talks uh, or maybe the second talk will be at like 1130, say, and it'll go to 1230. Then there'll be a lunch break, come back at 130 and have another talk till, you know, 230, 245 and then one last talk. So there'll be four talks a day at the venue instead of like 12 talks or whatever we were doing. We were just yeah. In. And then what the other thing we're doing this year is we're doing two days on. So Wednesday and Thursday, we'll have the talks. Friday is going to be a fully experiential day. So we still have the venue for that day, but we'll be doing aura experiments. And um, we have someone who's going to be doing palmistry, palm prints, and we'll be doing um, print out and like laminate your chart. Like it'll be more like a little like festival fair day where you can like go from table to table. We'll have uh, oh, we have 
um, it, this amazing tarot reader, uh, Robert Ray, who's just an incredibly gifted tarot reader. And he's going to be doing readings. So we're kind of just making it more, just mix it up a little bit. Like we'll have two days of, you know, human design talks. Then we'll just have a day of experiential and field trips and fun. And then two more days of talks. So that way it's kind of split up a little bit. I learned that from, from Alok Diaz's Pura Vida event in Costa Rica. He, uh, I, I think it actually came from Ra. I think he structured it the way Ra did, where Ra would do four talks a day of an hour and a half each. And then he would do two days on and then take a day off and then two days on and then take a day off. And so it's nice to kind of have, have that break where you're not just, you know, day three rolls around. Side and, question. Like if that was, did he do that consistently? Was it like he did like first line days and second line days and fourth line days and fifth line days? I don't think it had Something to do like with that. the line of the day it was. I don't think he would like choose to. But if he did it two on two, one off, two on one off, then it would it would line up in sixes. It would follow that pattern. Yeah, that's a good point. Although depending on when. So it I is, bet he yeah, took I mean, first. He would. He wouldn't skip fifth line days. So he probably took. I, I don't sixth think line days. I mean, maybe and third line days it. off. Maybe he took third I'm line sure days. Sure, it yeah. I would skip fifth yeah. line days. Honestly, that'd be my favorite day to skip because I think fifth line days you think? Are, it's one of the best days to just be alone and private and not in public. Oh, because then you get second line days off also. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That works. Yeah. I think third and I mean you definitely want a fourth line day on. That's a good on day. Those yeah. are great days. Yeah, yeah. Party and festival. And yeah, we'll have to check what uh, what lines the days fall on and kind of, it's still very much a work in progress, but I'm just really excited for this year. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to knock the last year. I mean, last year was also amazing. We just learned, we learned that it's nice to just like we had two stages. We could actually do two stages this year because the venue has an extra room, but we're choosing not to because it was just too much. People would be like, oh, yeah. both talks are at the same time and I'm going to miss this talk to go see Yeah, you that. had to miss things. And people yeah. were like coming in and out of the rooms and kind of, it's just, we're just going to keep it simple. Um, I mean, it's like, keep the eye on the goal. What is the goal? I, I'm a desire person. This is how I see it. You know, My goal is that everybody gets a lot of quality time meeting each other, hanging out, getting to know each other. They have an unforgettable, delightful experience. They learn something and they also, it's like, you just check the boxes. Like they're not overwhelmed. They get a nice pace. Everything is kind of paced well. And um, yeah, I'm really excited for this year. I think it's going to be best one yet and really feels like it's coming together really well. And uh, also, I you know, it's so early, like, the last couple of years, I kind of just threw it together in the last couple of months. I mean, we really, I mean, I also had a lot of help and, um, Jen Cole, Jenny V, Brian Beard. I mean, they killed it last year. They were like support MVP, you know, organizer MVPs. And, um, you know, it's, it's, but we did kind of rush it in the sense that it was like, we got to get all this stuff done. We got to rush. And this time there's like so much time. Like it's almost, I mean, it's April and we're talking about September. So I, I'm really happy about that. It's given me a much more leisurely approach to it and just getting the venue locked down so early and it just makes me really happy. So coming along. So are you going to stream it again? Oh, that's a good question. I would like to stream it. Uh, it really depends on if if we can figure that out because I like streaming, but I also know that that can take away. Um, I mean, it's definitely going to be recorded. It's going to be recorded. I don't know if it'll be streamed. I'd like to stream. Were it. you about to change the subject? Because that would be fine. Yeah, yeah. I was just. I thought. Well, I was. Just I thought say, it was like. I was like, going to say Austin, your, your Austin HD. We need a silly name for it. Honky Tonk HD. What is it? Uh, that, that does work. Yeah. Does work. We need Honky Tonk HD 2024. I'm rooting for it. So I would, I would be there. And uh, the only thing I know you don't, you don't like about my idea. 
our idea is I'm like, have it at your house, Dave. Your house is so cool. And you're like, I'm a 5'2", Jonah. I don't want a bunch of people at my house. <laughs> yeah. For those who don't know, we Dave's wouldn't, house we is wouldn't amazing. We wouldn't do it at my house. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, where would we do it then? Also, like, I'm not, I'm not going to organize an event. Like, I'm not I'll organize it. it. Just give me, give me the permission. No, we should do, we should do like dive bar, Austin crawl. <laughs> no. That would be sick. Right, we could each night is like a different do like, a neighborhood. Super casual conference, like no. It, it would just be like as the cards lay, just <laughs> okay. wherever we end up. Come at your own risk. <laughs> Come at your own risk. Dive bar Austin. We're only gonna go like we're just gonna crawl the different neighborhoods. Um, you got to wear cowboy boots. No, I don't know. You don't even own cowboy boots. What am I saying? Dude, I have, I wear size 15 shoes. <laughs> so like with a, with a pointy toe on it, like a, a cowboy boot on me <laughs> would just look ridiculous. Um, Although I, I, it would be awesome. Also, also I need, I don't have a cowboy hat either because my head well, is so big. We can hook that up in Santa Fe. You come out here and we will get you hooked up. So. It's not like they don't have them here. I think, uh, yeah, there's just, definitely some I, cowboy hats there. I went to the cowboy hat store and they were like, we have to special order you one. <laughs> yeah. but granted, that's when I had dreadlocks, but still. I want to see Dave I, with dreadlocks. And no, hats don't fit me. I'm excited to see Dave with dreadlocks. Never again. We'll see the... again never. I've seen you with a kind of a little bit of a fro. I mean, I've seen you with the bigger hair, but I want to see dreadlock Dave. Yeah, Ready, you, Dave. You're my Facebook friend. You can find the the <laughs> pictures. Well, I'm really excited. Also, just I don't want to circle back to this, but until uh, I just realized, I think it'll be a perfect time. So last year, I waited till Sunday to tell everybody all my Steve Rhodes stuff, because you know I was really hyped mm -hmm. on Steve Rhodes last year. And then Sunday, I told everybody, because I was like, you you all must be sick of human design by now. We've been talking about human design for four days. Let's do Steve Rhodes. This year we have, you know, it starts Wednesday, Wednesday, September 13th. Then we have Thursday. Those are going to be like human design days. Friday, we have kind of an off day. I think I'm going to drop cards of destiny on people on Friday. That's going to be my little, my little, please, Jonah, please come back to human design. Every year I have to do something that, that gets people to be like, Jonah, we really oh want God. you to stop talking about reincarnation and we want you to stop talking about Steve Rhodes. Come back to human design. Your human design family misses you. Come back into the fold, Jonah. And this year it's going to be Cards of Destiny. I'll be like, you're a jack of spades and you're a, you know, and they'll be like, come on. Or we'll, we'll just all play, we'll all, we'll all play six pack. Oh, that, yeah. So Jenny got me hooked on six pack and I have been, like, that is the funnest game. Six pack. When Jonah was here. We played six pack with everybody we hung out with every time we did anything. Yeah, I would either it was talk cool. about I would either talk about cards of destiny or we would play playing cards. Either way, it was all cards. Well, all cards. no, you would you would start the game, so the cards would come out. We'd play them and handle them and put them all over the table for a little while, and you're like, oh, by the way, cards of destiny. I happen to have the book right here. I happen to have the book. I can tell you your life spread. I can tell you, oh, this year you have a lot of travel. I mean, since all these cards are sitting with you, I mean, look, there's like a four of clubs sitting right there. I mean, it's kind of like, I've got to tell you something about four of clubs before we... Uh... I have to do something we to get everyone and to prompt them to be like, Jonah, please come back to human design. We are sick of this crap that you've gotten yourself into again. Every year, I need some the new crap. <laughs> no, the it's Cards not of Destiny it's is kind of fun to listen to you rant about. I don't mind it. It seems pretty on point when it comes down to it, when you tell me what people's cards are. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And then 
I just like that something, it's something. Piece. I, I like that Ra only asked the voice like a couple questions, I, maybe only one. You know, he didn't really ask it a lot, but one of his questions was, I think his question was like, is my dog dead? Or like, what's up with Barley, his dog? And then his other question was basically, what's up with the tarot cards? Like, why are they not included? You've given me the I Ching and the chakras and the Kabbalah and the, you know, this is like a Kabbalistic tree of life with the chakra system, with all the astrology. And and the voice basically said, um, the tarot cards are incarnation sequencing. And they go back to ancient Egypt or before. And they've the sequences have been diluted and lost. And basically, it's kind of worthless now because it's, it's the information. Okay, so I've heard him say this so many times, and I never know what he means by sequencing. Sequencing um, is which incarnation life, like you, like the sequence of lives that you have. If you imagine Dave Myers, then you imagine like, like beads on a necklace and each bead like is a soul that's been threaded through and you, or I mean, it's the same soul, I guess, but it's an incarnation. So your previous life and the life before that and the life before that and the life before that. And what is the sequence of these? And Ra actually did a whole series on incar I mean, a series of talks. It's not too many. I think it's like four. But he did a short series of talks on incarnation sequencing. Maybe he did like six. And it's really inscrutable. I have listened to it a couple times. I've never really been able to figure it out. Um, you know, Alokanand Diaz was actually there in person, and he translated it. And he told me that it was something that he had a difficult time. I mean. He followed it, but it's like you follow what Ra's saying. But okay, so before you get any further, like, what do you? It's so what? Like, okay, there's a bunch. There's there's a certain number of cards, and they they go in a certain order for everyone. They would be in a different order or something. Like, how does that have anything to do with reading tarot cards? Like, it, well, I think. Do, what it is, is when you're using the tarot cards for divination, that's kind of like using the I Ching for divination. You throw the I Ching and it like tells you, oh, I got, you know, hexagram 32. I got hexagram 58. It just kind of tells you, you know, that's that's not, I guess what I'm saying is the same way that we then use the hexagrams to understand all these deep mechanical truths you don't really need to like cast the tarot cards. Like you can, you can use them for divination, but you can also just see them as a system of relationships or a matrix almost. And that's what I like about cards of destiny, which are the same as the minor arcana of the tarot, more or less. Um, just as a side note, there's so many mathematical, like just take a deck of playing cards. There are 52 cards in the deck. Well, there's 52 weeks in the year. And if you add up the value of every card in the deck, like ace is one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on, and you add up all the numbers, it ends up being 364, which is one short of the number of days in a year, which is the joker. But, you know, there's all sorts of little mathematical tricks like that. So uh, I, won't, sure. uh, I won't do a whole TED talk on it, but, but I, I definitely... Can we get back to the tarot real quick, though? Sure, Cause absolutely. Because like, Ross said that the tarot had been compromised. It wasn't, it wasn't that it... It, was just, it wasn't that it wasn't valid. It's that it wasn't complete anymore. Well, the sequences were lost. Or something. The sequences have been lost. That there were all of these different sequences, which were fundamental sequences, in that they'd been lost. You mean like the sequences in the in the Cards of Destiny book? I maybe. Is I mean, you mean, they are definitely sequences. They're like you don't, you don't know what he means by sequences. Well, I just know that he means the the order, the different orders the cards could go in. That those have been lost. So it's not that the cards themselves are incomplete, but that the original information from ancient Egypt was kind of what order to put the cards in, and you could put them in one sequence. And then you could put them in a different sequence and you could put them in a third sequence and a fourth sequence. And each sequence basically had some sort of deep metaphysical truth to the ordering of events. Not even just, it's kind of like micro macro, like not even just lifetimes, but like within a life, like there are sequences of events that occur. 
And those sequences can be represented as an ordering of cards, kind of like how the I Ching is in a certain sequence. And in Ra's incarnation sequencing materials, he actually looks at what he calls the base sequences. And the base sequences are really interesting because basically they follow a formula where it'll go from one gate to its opposite gate. Then it'll go back 88 degrees, then to its opposite. Then it'll go back 88 degrees, then to its opposite. Then it'll go back 88 degrees and its opposite. And it kind of moves around the wheel in this way that almost looks like a Celtic knot. That's kind of, you know, each gate leads to another gate. First it goes to its opposite, then it moves 88 degrees. Then it goes to its opposite. It's a spirograph. Yeah, it's a spirograph. It's a, it's a spirograph. You have this circle and it's kind of making this weird shape on the circle. And that's how I understand it with incarnation sequencing is that, you know, people use the tarot cards kind of just to, in a different way because they're sort of an archetypal, um, they're almost like a book of symbols. Like they just are like, they're kind of just like the building blocks. They're, they're like an alphabet right. of archetypes. And so that's how they use them is like what archetype Wait, are you so get today? If... Yeah, but that's not originally how okay, they were used. Wait, they weren't used the, that way in Egypt. But when he asked the, the the voice why it wasn't incorporated into the system, the voice said because it's just not there's not enough of it for us to. to I don't use, think it's that right? there's not there's enough cards. Missing. I think it's that it's either been corrupted, quote unquote, or just that. Um, I think well, who gives a shit? The voice can just be like, here, do this. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it yeah, it's a good like, question of like, if the voice knows the everything or it doesn't, couldn't the voice just tell him? And yeah, I mean, it didn't. Yeah. It wasn't like, here's exactly how the Kabbalah is connected to it. It's just like, yeah, Kabbalah, right? Yeah, I just think... like so vaguely similar. And then it's just like, oh, but tarot. Oh, uh, yeah, we can't. I don't know. I forgot the sequence. I lost the I lost the combination. <laughs> yeah, or maybe just that, like you're saying, like, is it really relevant? I mean, if the reason the voice was trying to get this information out was to prepare us for the coming of a new intelligence of the rave, and so that people would be able to kind of usher in this new era, maybe it wasn't relevant to that new era. You know, maybe that was some mystical information that... That wasn't really part. How of do you program. feel about so many human design people using tarot cards in their, I don't know, in their video and at least their YouTube videos? Like what, it, what can somebody really be like, here's a reading for, for manifesting generators this June, you know, like, oh, there's going to be a lot of something. Is that, could yeah, somebody that do that? I mean, can you? That's a little fishy to me because the best readings I've seen for the Tarot have been very personal to people, but it does raise an interesting question of, is there a sort of a synchronistic effect where you encounter something at exactly the right moment for it to be meaningful to you? It's an interesting question. Um, let's do let's do one more video here i know that we're kind of pushing it and it's like is enough really enough? <laughs> but let's let's take one more short break when we come back and this next one can be kind of short okay. i just want to talk about um i've had this interesting idea and it was a conversation i had with mike a few days ago have you ever heard of naughty leaves n-a-d-i naughty leaves i haven't no, okay. I was gonna just trying to come up with a quick pun, but I, I, I failed. So just yeah. keep going. Yeah, like like I've heard of naughty, uh, you know, people, but not not leaves. Well, um, well, yeah, I don't have a pun either. I'm not a, I'm not a punster. You well, fig I'm leaf little... or something, you know, like you cover your junk with it. I don't know. Right? Is is that what you know? We'll, Adam and we'll Eve get back had to you. In the the Garden of Eden, or yeah, I don't know. Um, right. But I want to yeah. talk a little bit We're about the, We are such a great comedy team. <laughs> I want to talk about those, though, because it does raise an interesting uh, topic, which is how synchronicity works. And uh, I have a couple interesting comments on it. I'd love to hear your feedback on it. So take a short break. When we return, the final segment of Frequency is a Human Design podcast with Dave Myers, Neutrino Radio. <laughs> And your host, Jonah Dempsey. 
You should always be recording because your funniest stuff. Anyway, okay. Um. The funniest stuff is when I'm bitching about how technology is stupid. All right, welcome back. We are in the last segment with Dave Myers, Neutrino Radio, and uh, we were talking about nadi leaves. So nadi leaves are these really interesting. Um, texts that were found in the 1500s in India when a, uh, a sort of a shrine or maybe a, 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 I don't know if it was a palace or you know what exactly it was, but this building was destroyed and all of these leaves were found in its basement. And they had text on them, but people, it's not like a common language to actually translate, to decipher the text the ability to read and understand it has been passed down through a very special group of mystical, kind of a mystical secret society, if you will, in India. And it's been passed down generation after generation. And what's interesting is uh, some of these leaves, most of them would just, they were, they would dissolve. Like they were just fall to dust because they're thousands of years old. But when you say leaves, do you mean literally leaves or is that it's another word for a piece of paper i think it's paper but it's basically leaves of a certain plant that have been written on i think i mean as far as i know so these cool. are like okay it's kind of like papyrus leaves. or something i think they call them naughty leaves but yeah i guess okay sheets of paper so these stacks right. and stacks and stacks of like very old like thousands of years old paper were discovered and, you know, many of them, just when you touch them or when the air kind of hit them from the people discovering them, they just turned to dust. They just fell apart. Don't even look at them. Yeah, you just look at them and they just, you know, just, do the... Uh, just do don't the even exactly. look. But what's interesting is some of them, in fact, a great many of them are still around. And you can send your thumbprint, uh, maybe other fingerprints as well, to these orders of clerics who know how to translate the naughty leaves and they will look for your leaf they will look for a leaf for you and what's really outrageous is they know how to translate from this language in the naughty leaves to a sort of phonetic um, sound alike you know they can translate it to contemporary syllables and the leaves, so to find your leaf, like say you send them a thumbprint. Transliterate it? Yeah, maybe? I guess. You send them your thumbprint, and then they like narrow it down based on the, the kind of characteristics, kind of like palmistry. They narrow it down based on the characteristics of your thumbprint. And so they figure out what stack it would be in. Then they go through the stack, and then they're like, okay, is your mother's name Mary? You're like, no. Is your father's name Bill? No, was your brother's name Frank? And they go through, but they have all these like English names or French names or Japanese names, or it's like the names are very, like names that didn't exist thousands of years ago, but they figured out how to translate these syllables to contemporary names. Now here's the really what? trippy thing. No, believe me, this is weird. Wait, that's what you meant? Okay, yeah, keep going. So here's, all right. well, what I'm talking about is, there's a really interesting question that happens because they find your leaf and they go along and finally they're like, okay, is your sister Sally? And you're like, yes. And they're like, is your brother this? And then they're like, was your first wife named this? And like, yeah. And they're like, okay, here, we found your leaf. And they tell you all this information and they sometimes give you things. The to fuck? Yeah. They're like, you have like this karma you have to release from a previous life where you like hurt these people. So you have to go to such and such town and find a homeless person named this. And you have to like feed this person and bathe them and like buy them new clothes and like do all these, not like literally bathe them, but you know, make sure they get a bath, make sure they have to support it. <laughs> yeah. Here's a sponge. <laughs> you have to give them a sponge bath. <laughs> no, but you know, they give you these tasks, these tasks to clear your karma. Now here's what's so interesting. The leaves are crumbling like all the time. 
And so my theory is that the leaf crumbles when a person makes a decision in their life where the decision tree precludes them from ever being on the trajectory of encountering that leaf. But the leaves that don't crumble Ooh. are like waiting to They're basically still waiting. to encounter the person. But it's like, how does so the no leaf... one ever wait? So that would mean that no one would ever show up and their leaf would be unfindable. Well, the leaf just dissolves once it's like impossible for them to ever show up to it. Right. So if they do show up, there's a leaf for them. There's basically, yes, there's no something like that. I mean, I don't know if there are cases where people try to get the leaves done and it's already been destroyed. I don't know, but it seems to me like so each some... of them, each it's leaf. Well, it's a really is, hard, it's a self-contained piece of information or yeah. it has a beginning and an end of some sort. Yeah, like it's like it, a paragraph and sometimes like the text will be destroyed and they'll only be able to read parts of it and they'll only be able to tell you parts of it. But the interesting thought experiment, what's that? How many are there? That is a really good question. I had that same question. I asked chat GPT and it wouldn't tell me, but I think there are hundreds of thousands. Yeah. I think there are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to know. This was a this was like almost like the real life representation of the Akashic records or something that was discovered. You know, just just rooms and rooms full of just stacks of sheets. And so it's it's an interesting thought experiment because you start to go, how could this be possible? But what I wanted to compare this to was the notion that in 1781 the nine centered being emerged coinciding with the discovery i keep slurping in the microphone i'm so sorry I'm it's okay try well, not to. yeah this is it's good tea you know i have uh i have cup number two rather it's a refill i just keep putting hot water in my tea until it's nothing left you know i don't do that man i, I re-bag every time i don't play okay well all right so so naughty leaves yeah and okay i don't even know where we're going with this in well, general so i'm just I'm well like, here's where we're going wait. with it here's where we're going with it human design tells us from ra's encounter with the voice that the discovery of the planet uranus coincided with the advent of the nine centered being pretty big coincidence and then beyond that we discovered neptune with kind of coinciding with this spiritual development of a new kind of emotional consciousness and we discovered pluto in 1930 coinciding with a newfound psychological interiority and depth. And it seems that the discovery of different planetary archetypes synchronistically relates to what's going on in the human psyche at a given point in history. It's an interesting idea that similarly sure. to how there's a naughty leaf that's been sitting in this basement for 2000 years, waiting for the person to kind of collide with it, there's a planet that's been sitting in space waiting to be discovered at the precise moment that it will take on a name and an archetype that represents what the collective psyche is going through at that time in Dude. history. Right? So this circles yes. back to our whole free will determinism thing. It's interesting, right? So I just kind of, and then I guess the last thing I'll say is, I have a friend who who's very deep into asteroids. Have you ever looked into? You don't really do a lot of astrology, right? I mean, some, but you haven't. Like, have you looked at asteroids in astrology? Well, I thought in astrology I had, in, in astrology, asteroidology, asteroids. Well, not they, astronomy, but astrology. In astrology, right? In astrology, That's like right. the like right. the meanings of asteroids. Like I don't mean just like oh they exist, but what do they mean? You know, what what is the significance mm -hmm. of asteroids? I have not even pondered it. Well, it's interesting because there are a number of asteroids that are more commonly looked at in astrology ever since Demetra George and some other astrologers in the nineteen seventies began to interpret them. And of course, it they were discovered around this time. Chiron, I think, was discovered in, in 1970, so, something like that. And so Chiron became associated with the wounded healer archetype in part because what was going on in the collective zeitgeist of the 1970s was a lot of self-help and healing movements. 
Um, and then as we go on, more recently in 2006, Eris was discovered, which was actually, it's the named for uh, the goddess of discord, discordia to the Greeks, Eris to the Romans. And Eris actually caused so much discord that because Eris was bigger than Pluto, Pluto lost its status as planet temporarily. Now Pluto is seen as a planet again because it has other characteristics of planets that have kind of, it's regained its status. But I guess my point is these asteroids also were synchronistically discovered at key moments in the development of the human psyche and came to represent things going on in that time. Well, there's about 2 million asteroids that haven't really been astrologically um, interpreted much, but they have very interesting names. I mean, there's an asteroid called Lust. There's an asteroid called Merlin. There's an asteroid called Einstein. I mean, there's asteroids that represent kind of the modern pantheon of archetypes, celebrities, different things. And uh, from talking with a, a, a friend of mine who's very into studying the asteroids, it almost feels... At first, it's like, how could this be? Why would these have any significance at all? But then you start to think about the Nadi leaves, or you start to think about why did Uranus, why was that discovered with the advent of the, of the nine-centered being? Like, there's a certain synchronistic lockstep where some leaf is sitting in a basement for 2,000 years waiting to collide with you. It's kind of like, do you ever see the movie 127 Hours? You, you ever watch that movie? No. Oh, it's a movie about trapped. it's a movie about a hiker who gets stuck in a rock. Who just to cut off his arm. Yeah. And it shows yeah. in the beginning. It's James much, Franco, isn't it? James Franco, exactly. It's a really good movie. And yeah. hopefully not too much of a spoiler, it shows this rock sitting there for millions of years, millennia, and that rock has just not moved. That rock has been sitting there so long, and here's the human doop -doop -doop, driving the car and going here, and oh, here's the human hiking along, and the rock is just sitting, and the rock is just sitting, and bam, gets stuck in the rock. And that's kind of what life is like. That's the no choice. You know, the no choice is... The monopole. It's the monopole. That's the no choice. It's just draws the person yeah. is drawn to their leaf. You know, we're drawn to discover yeah. Uranus at the same time as we go through this Uranian movement. It's like these things happen together. It's the monopole. It is. So anyway, that's and I think the asteroids work that way too. Is that what you know. were? Yeah. Is that when you said you wanted to talk about um, serendipity? Is that what you meant? Yeah, or synchronicity, um, meaningful coincidence, synchronicity. things that just kind of happen together but don't have any obvious causal relationship to each other. Um, and that's just kind of one of those interesting things that also brings up the question of no choice and also brings up like there's no choice but there are decision trees and what avenue there are times where something would be possible like it would be possible for this person if they follow the right path of the decision tree the correct trajectory they will end up finding their naughty leaf but if they follow a different trajectory they'll they'll make it impossible to ever find that leaf and the leaf crumbles be, the leaf crumbles at the point that person has made a choice in the decision tree that prevents them from ever so so does people find their naughty leaves because they find out that there's this thing called a naughty leaf and then they decide they're going to go find their find out what their naughty leaf is and then they go to the place and they're like i want to know what my naughty leaf is and then somebody's like oh you made it all the way here yeah we'll give you your we'll find your naughty leaf yeah, that's basically how it works. Then, but now it's so high tech, you can literally take a thumbprint and mail it in with like a couple hundred bucks and someone will just look for it for you and they will send you back what they find or there'll be a phone call and they'll, you know, it might take six months, but you'll get a call and they'll say, we, we found your stack and they'll just go through it and be like, is your mom named Martha? Is your dad named Bob? And they just kind of go through it with you and uh, until they find yours. And I heard somebody talking about some, some old school HD person talking about how they found 
human design and it had to do originally with them going to some guy this was like real early and it wasn't raw that's chet was, Parkin. you're talking about chetan is it chetan yeah Chetin. yeah yeah yeah, yeah he, exactly and he was it, like and he was like, they they knew my name and my all. And this they kind told of me that I was on a mission, and my mission would be to to bring this new information to the world and all this stuff. Yeah, and that was what's called a shadow reader, which is a similar kind of a thing. The shadow readers of India. So it's a similar. I don't know that the shadow reader references a leaf, or maybe they just. You know, that's that's another mystery to me. They said he like went to a, a bookshelf and eventually came up with something that like had his fucking name in it something i mean like that. that's how synchronicity works there are these steve rhodes has had a lot of interesting synchronicities in his life in his book the god code we are robots he talks about uh, some of his interesting synchronicities um and yeah, it really, I mean, that's the true mysticism. I mean, there there is a whole mystical side to human design that uh, is kind of very inexplicable, you know, ha I mean, very far-fetched. It's like some of it you're like, oh, that's not too far-fetched. Like, I could see how that could be. Like, I really love how Genoa Blyven describes the development of human DNA basically evolving it, you know, out of the ocean. We all came out of the ocean, out of sort of early creatures, pre-human, far pre-human, but the DNA that eventually became human, thousands after thousands of years and millions and millions of years as sort of protozoic sludge was essentially um, being pelted by neutrinos in a very consistent fixed way because of the Earth's rotation around the sun. So because it was so fixed, similarly to how um, scientists say that the eye developed to be to see because it was a mucous membrane, it was kind of a thinner part of the of form that that then was pelted by photons until it learned to adapt to interpret the photons as light. Similarly, the DNA was just pelted by neutrinos for so many millions of years in such a symmetrical, perfect annual cycle order, you know, it would be in the exact same order of neutrinos, like the exact same quality of neutrinos in the exact same sequence coming from the exact same stars year after year after year after year for just millions and millions of years, eventually created these receptors that were able to basically form the same way that I formed to see photons, our DNA formed to be activated by neutrinos. So it's a very good scientific mm. explanation to me. It basically is saying, you know, because we grew up in this sort of uh, context or this situation of a very orderly annual sequence of the different qualities of neutrinos from different stars, yeah, it makes sense. But then you get to stuff like the nine-centered being emerged with the discovery of Uranus. And you're like, how how did the time like perfectly synchronize with the discovery and naming of a planet? You know what I mean? Like that is like like human design gives you both like really good scientific explanations for some stuff and then things that are just so hard to understand from the perspective of science because they're just pure synchronicity. It's like obviously it's I mean a half the people out there don't even realize that it's just a it's just coinciding that most people are like and it's because we found uranus and now we got nine centers got started by finding it and that's like that's half of the people in hd think that's how it works well but even i mean who's to say i mean it's like causality or correlation either way it coincided and so it's just such an interesting it just, it's just an interesting thing. It's an interesting point that, you know, we have some scientific descriptions or at least descriptions that are compatible with science. Then we have other things that are just like, how do these cycles coincide so perfectly with what seems like a coincidence? Like even the naming of the planets, it just seems so... But I mean, you know, I, I guess it could also be a little bit of the fallacy of like, once it's been named something, we look for reasons it was named that. But it's just kind of, 
it's just kind of an interesting point. So yeah, I, mean, I, I love think both of sides. An analogy, and I can't. Well, I, I just would say, I guess in closing, I love both sides of human design. I love how scientific it gets. I love how mystical it gets. And and like you mentioned earlier, the two hats. Ra predicted that neutrinos had mass. Um, that was in 1990. It was discovered in 1998 they did have mass, and he stopped wearing his mystical fez or a mystical kind of cap and began wearing baseball caps after that. And that was kind of his symbolic transition to a new phase instead of human design as mysticism, human design as science. Because he, he didn't have to masquerade as that guru guy anymore. He was, had been justified. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I guess thank was... you. Okay. Any yeah. any parting yeah. shots? Any final final thoughts? Final mystical ponderings? Mm. I I got nothing. Um, I don't know. We can we can do this again if you want. Yeah, let's. I would love that. I would absolutely love to uh, have you as a guest again. And uh, this has been a delightful talk. I always I love. Uh, how your mind works and uh thank you thank you so much for being a guest so until next time you're welcome awesome all right thanks bye, bye.